This video shows you how to perform a chi-squared test on a two-way table, a contingency table, using Google Sheets. The methods work pretty much the same with any other spreadsheet software as well. It's aimed at IB diploma students who are completing their internal assessment and need to show that they understand the process for calculating a chi-squared test. And by using the technology, we're avoiding a lot of repetitive calculation. I do assume that the you already know how to calculate a chi-squared test and how to perform it and how to interpret it. We're not going to talk about the theory of it at all here. We're just going to talk about how to use the technology. There are some built-in functions that will do a lot of what we're going to do, but that won't meet the requirements of the IA. However, we will refer to them at the end so that we can check our work is correct. And if you have to do a lot of these, it's useful to know what the functions are because they can save you time in the long run. So we'll start by looking at a table of observed values here. And I have some data from a school canteen, cafeteria, um, showing students from year 7, year 10 and year 13 and whether they chose the chicken, beef or vegetarian meal. And that's our data set that we're going to work on analysing. So before we get started with the analysis, I'm just going to do some reformatting so that we can see what's going on a little bit more easily. First of all, I'm going to zoom in to 150%, so it's a little bit larger. Um, then I'm going to change the font here. And to do that, if I click in this cell above the 1 and to the left of the A, it selects the entire table. Um, I prefer Verdana font, and I'm going to change the font size to size 12, just so things are a little bit clearer. Um, you'll notice as well that I've center aligned the numbers. If you don't know how to do that, um, it's on the Align button here, and I've center aligned them. It's going to make things a little bit easier to see as we work through it. Okay, um, the first thing we need to do is we need to add the row totals and the column totals. So we'll do the row total for year 7 first. We'll click in the cell next to the vegetarian column and the quick way to do this is a built-in formula if we go up here to where the sigma sign is and it says functions click on it and choose sum that means add them together it puts our formula in there and we can just click and drag the three numbers we want and it tells us there were 40 year sevens to save a bit of time we can drag fill if we hover over the bottom right hand corner we get the black cross the cursor changes into a black cross just click drag and let go and it fills everything in there. Incidentally, if you're trying to do this on a laptop trackpad, it can be a bit fiddly and I would recommend you get yourself a mouse. It'll make things a little bit easier. Okay, we need to do the same on the bottom. Click underneath the chicken column, functions, sum, click and drag to select the three numbers, press enter and then drag that across. Now I could have dragged it right to the end but I just want to show you how the sum can be used in a slightly different way to get the overall total again functions sum and I don't just need to select a row or a column for this I can actually select the whole table so I can select from B2 to D4 the entire table press enter and there's our total there were 110 students. Okay we ought to um, add some layout things here we ought to put total titles to show us that this is the total. Um, and we're going to make copies of this table because this is the observed values. We want to work out the expected values and we want to work out the chi-squared statistics. So in this box here, I'm just going to type observed so that I know these are the observed data values. It's also worth having a look at... Um, changing some of the design elements here just to make things a little bit clearer so we might want to make the rows and columns of the heading bolder so they stand out in the totals bolder um, and perhaps change the font color here um, so that it stands out we know it's the observed table you can play around with shading if you want to make this look a bit clearer but i just wanted to do some basic things so that we can separate out the data we collected from the calculations we've performed Now we have our observed data table with totals, we need to begin the calculations. So I'm going to make a copy of this. I'll just click and drag to select the whole table. Again, probably easier to do with a mouse than on a trackpad. Edit, copy. There are keyboard shortcuts, which I'll use next time. Um, press that. 
uh, I'll leave a space here, an empty, an empty row. Um, click in A7 and edit, paste and I have an exact copy of my table but this is going to become the expected values table so I'll just click in here by the way you can save yourself some time you don't need to double click you can just single click in here and type the word expected and it over types what was already in the cell now I'm going to leave the totals in there for now we're going to use them at the end but I don't want to use them in the calculation part I need to calculate the expected values in each of these cells I'll do the chicken for year 7 first as it's top left. Click in the cell. Typing the equal sign tells the software that you're going to perform a calculation. And what we want is the total number of year 7s times the total number of people who had chicken divided by the total number of people we collected data for. But I'm going to take the totals from the observed table and you'll see why at the end. So year 7s, and I can just click on the cell here. I'll just click on the 40 and it puts the correct cell reference in the table below, in the formula box below rather. Multiplied by, the multiplication sign is the star above the 8, so shift 8 will get me that. The total number of people who had chicken, that's in cell B5. And then divide, divide is the forward slash symbol, and divide by the total total. And I'll press enter, and there's the value. Now, I've got quite a few decimal places there, that's going to be a recurring problem. So to solve that, I'm just going to select the entire table, including the total columns for now. And if I go up to the menu bar at the top, there's this button here that says Decrease Decimal Places. I'll just press that a few times until I get one decimal place I think should be enough. So that's OK. That looks a little bit tidier now. It's added one decimal place everywhere, but that's not a problem. OK. Now I've typed that formula in the first cell, I can drag fill. So I'll drag fill across and ah if I drag fill down I've got a problem there so I have these errors everywhere else let me just click in cell C8 to see what went wrong with beef to calculate the expected number of year sevens having beef uh, we should have calculated um, E2 times C5 divided by E5 so let's have a look in there um, I was actually done F2 times C5 times F5. So as we've dragged the formula across, so the cell references have changed. So the E2 for chicken, year 7, has become F2. We didn't want that E to change. Let's have a look at what's happened for year 10 chicken. Well, as we've dragged it down, we've got E3. That's correct. That's the year 10 total. Divided by B6. Well, we wanted B5. The 5 has changed to a 6 because the cell reference has changed. That's called relative cell references. Whenever we copy formulae, by default, they adjust to the new location because more often than not, that's what we want. But we don't want that to change. We want to always be using column E and we want to always be using row 5. So there's a way we can do that. Let's go back to our original formula. We have E2 times B5 divided by E5. In front of all the things we want to fix, we're going to put a dollar sign. And the things we want to fix are the E column and the 5 row. So in front of the E, we put a dollar. In front of the 5, we put a dollar. And in front of the E and the 5, we put a dollar. Press Enter. And now we'll do the same. We'll drag fill. Now, oh, those error messages have gone, we'll fill down, those have gone, and what's even better is we can check the totals, and we notice that the totals are exactly the same as they should have been. If you really want to, we can decrease the decimals here, so we don't have the decimal places on the totals, and we now have our expected values table. The next stage of the test is to calculate the chi-squared test statistic for each cell of this table and then sum those to get the total test statistic. So we need to make another copy of this table. So again, we'll select and this time I'm going to use the keyboard. I'm using a Windows machine so it's Control c it'll be Command c on a Mac. Leave an empty row and Control v pastes. And I'm going to change the expected to be test statistic. Okay, 
it's a little bit large there so I can go up and if I double click between A and B it'll just widen that column for me. Right, I need to calculate the test statistics. So again, go to the first box and type equals to show we're doing a calculation. Again, the calculation should be known here. We're not going through the theory of the chi-square test. So the first part is to find the difference between the observed and the expected value. Square that. To square it, we use the uh, carrot symbol, that's the up arrow pointing, uh, the arrow pointing upwards above the 6 on the keyboard and 2 because it's the power of 2 and then we divide that by the expected value so again click on cell B8 for the expected value click there, we get our chi-squared chi test statistic for that cell we probably want some more decimals there so let's increase the number of decimal places to 3 we can now drag that across to the right notice that we change the number of decimal places in all those cells as well and drag that down and there we have our chi-squared statistics. Um, these ones don't really make much sense, these totals now, so we can delete them and delete those and this is our total statistic but obviously we need some more decimal places so let's just extend that to three decimal places as well. And there we have our chi-squared st test statistic for this set of data. At one little point, we were doing a 3x3 three three table, which is fine to use here, and we, our expected values were high enough. If you've got a 2x2 two two table and you're doing the Yates's continuity correction, you need to type that in at the point where you enter that formula. So within the parentheses, you'll do observed minus expected, but you need to include the extra minus 0 0.5 for the continuity correction within the parentheses there. OK, we have our test statistic. That's the part of the calculation, or the difficult part of the calculation over. Now we need to draw the conclusions for the test, and that will be in the final part. And we'll check that our work is correct as well. So the final stage is to draw some conclusions about the test result. I've put in here in column G the information we need to be able to do that. Uh, I've just typed it in at the um, for now, and but we can format this a little bit. I'd like this left aligned rather than right aligned, so I'll, I'll actually select the whole of column G um, and left align that. Um, the column's not wide enough. If I go between the G and H, my cursor changes to that horizontal line with two arrow heads. If I double click, it'll make the column wider, uh, and I might just drag that a little bit smaller so I have the information clearly here. You can make these bold if you want, uh, it's not really important. So the significance level, now we haven't mentioned this in the test, but let's assume we're using a 5% significance level. If you enter that as a decimal, 0 0.05, go back and select the box, and then on the top menu bar here, you have, or the toolbar, you have a percentage button. If we click on that, it displays it as 5%. Degrees of freedom, this can be calculated, but the process for doing it is a lot more difficult than just looking at it and working it out yourself. But we can see that the degrees of freedom, it's a 3x3 three three table, so the degrees of freedom is 2x2, two two, which is 4, so we can just type that in. Um, the test statistic, well, we worked that out, so if we press equals, we can pick that up from that box, and it will just make a copy of whatever that calculation was in the box. Right. Now the next two, we need to know the probability of getting that test statistic on a table with degrees of freedom 4. So we need to use one of the built-in functions to do that. And the function we use is the chi distribution function. So type equals to show that we're going to do a calculation, and then we start typing the word chi. You should get a list of functions appear down the bottom, and we want to choose the chi dist. It calculates the right tail chi-squared distribution. That's the probability of getting a test statistic of 13.245 or higher. So we'll click on that. It then says, what's our test statistic? X. So we'll click there. How many? Put, put a comma in place and then degrees of freedom. Well, that's there. Close the brackets. Press enter. We've got a long decimal number. Let's just change that into a percentage. There we go. 1.01%. So it's below our 5% significance level. That means we would reject the null hypothesis in this case. Um, the fact that these two variables, choice of lunch and um, year group of student, are independent. We would reject that and assume that they are not independent.
Now the other thing we can do obviously to compare the test is to look at the test statistic that we would want, the critical value. What critical value would we want for a 5% significance level at 4 degrees of freedom? It's going to be a bit below 13.24 but we can just calculate that, we can just calculate that using a built-in function um, just to check and that function again equals start typing the word chi and it's chi inv, it's the inverse so it gets us back to the test statistic. Probability well, we want to know the critical value at the 5% level, so let's click on the 5%, comma, and again, of course, we need to know the degrees of freedom. Close the brackets, and there we go, and we'll just reduce the number of decimal places. And so the critical value was quite a bit lower than the score we got, the 13.254. It was actually 9.488. So our test statistic was higher than our critical value, meaning we reject H0, the null hypothesis. Similarly, our p-value was below the significance level, confirming we would reject the null hypothesis. There's one last thing I'd like to show you about Google Sheets and the chi-squared test. This will help you check your work to confirm that everything's OK. And it's also useful if you're doing more of these tests, because you only need to show this evidence once for your IA. If we click here, I've got some check values here. I want to just check that p-value, and I'm going to use the built-in functionality. This is what your calculator will do for you, but it does it a lot more quickly on the, um, the spreadsheet. I think it's a little bit easier than using your calculator. So if we click in the next cell and we start typing equals chi, one of the options we haven't looked at here is chi test. And it says performs a Pearson chi-squared test. Click on that. The first thing it wants is our observed data range. So let's just click and drag to select our observed data, comma, it now wants our expected range. Click and drag. So unlike the calculator, which calculates your expected values, this function doesn't. So we'll close our brackets there, press enter, and it reports our p-value. I'll just turn that into a percentage with two decimal places, and we can confirm it's the same p-value as we calculated manually. It doesn't tell us our test statistic, but we can work that out by finding out what the critical value would be, or what the value would be, that will give this p-value. And we do that using the function that we've already seen, so equals chi inverse, and we want to know what the um, test statistic would have to be for this probability, 1.01. .01. So we'll click on that probability, comma, click on the degrees of freedom, close the brackets, press enter, and there we go, we'll just reduce the decimal places, but there we go, we have the same value as we calculated manually. So that confirms that our calculations were correct, but this might be a slightly faster process than using your GDC, using your calculator to work it out.